Hey, how's it going? Today I'm continuing to knock out the backlog of requests I've gotten, and this was one of the ones that I wasn't initially excited for. Zapdos requests go back about half a year, and I've gotten multiple comments, mainly from the same person, that sort of keep hyping it up as something that's going to struggle on Bruno. And after hearing it for so long, it's time to see if the stories and the legends are true. In the entire vastness that is YouTube, only a single Generation 1 solo run of Zapdos exists, and that's J Rose's video on it, so I could see why someone would think that since there's nothing to the contrary out there. Maybe I'm in denial, or maybe I'm just delusional, but I think that Zapdos will be better than running into a brick wall at the world's most pathetic trainer, and today I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is and prove it. But before we begin, I would like to say that I do solo run content often, and if that is of interest to you, consider subscribing to the channel. Likes and comments also help break into the algorithm, and you guys have been doing a great job of helping this community grow, so if you or someone who just never comments in videos or interacts, just this once scroll down and type in Big Bird so maybe YouTube will bless us once again by recommending the video to other interested people. And with that said, sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop, and let's see if Bruno finally earns his spot on the Elite Four. Like always, I make sure Zapdos has good DVs, and for this run, the only name fitting for a legendary Thunderbird is Big Bird, and from there we can start making our way to Sesame Street. Considering Zapdos' starting moves, there's really no challenging choices for the starter for the rival. Drill Peck will just murder Bulbasaur, and electric moves will dominate Squirtle, and Charmander eventually when it evolves. I choose Squirtle because that takes Gyarados off of his final team, and we all know that Gary is the poster child for electric weakness in Pokemon. As far as the early game, goes, I do pick up all of the trainers, including the optional rival fight, and none of it is difficult at all. Without diving into the stats just yet, Zapdos's special is fantastic and Thundershock has a lot of PP and we can just mow down anything in our way. I save power points of Drill Peck for the more pressing matters and things are just really smooth here. I'd also like to take this time to say that I did two runs with Zapdos. We are watching the second run and the main reason without going into it too much right now is that I made some mistakes. And I I just knew that I could save some significant time, and you guys know that I always want a Pokemon to be at its best. With Zapdos' typing, you might be thinking ahead about Brock, but before we get there, I'd like to say that perfect DVs do actually make a difference in this run. By the time I'm through with all the fights and I get past the Light Years Junior Trainer Battle, I do hit level 10, and this is pretty significant with perfect DVs because it gives me just a little bit of higher speed than Onyx, which completely eliminates the need to grind any further. So let's hop right into Brock. Ground types are immune to electric attacks, and Drill Peck's going to be resisted, but I don't know if you guys have taken a look at Zapdos' stats yet, but they are pretty much all amazing. 100 base speed gives us 19.5% chance to crit, and an 80 base power stabbed move with 90 base attack on our Biki boy. Things just aren't going to be as bad as you might expect. I actually kind of get unlucky with crits until the very end of the fight, but I do enough damage to where one crit puts Geodude low enough to where I can just finish it off on the next turn. I do crit a second time, but I don't think that one mattered. As far as Onyx goes, while we don't technically have a non-damaging move, Ground Types being immune to Thundershock serves the same purpose for the Bide. Brock doesn't even really end up using Bide that much beside one time, and I do actually make some minor mistakes here and there, but I'm still able to get past this one on the first attempt, and that bodes pretty well for the run. And if you are curious, on the first run I also beat Brock on my very first attempt, and it was much cleaner than this one. After beating the rock solid Pokemon trainer, Zapdos saves at 15 minutes of in-game time and that's actually a pretty strong start. From there, all the normal poison and bug types are tiny little speed bumps and before we zoom to this part I'd like to talk about Drill Peck for a second. Mainly just the fact that it's a very rare move. Only three total Pokemon learn it and the other two are Doduo and Dodrio. While it's not the best move in the world, it's probably the best flying move and it's great to have this early. And for that one person that argued with me that Drill Peck deserves to be on the best moves list, just stop it. You're embarrassing yourself. Picking back up in Cerulean, being in the slow leveling group means that I'm only level 15, so I go for rival number 2 first. Just like with the Pikachu run, it feels great to have super effective damage on the Pidgeotto. I don't even bother healing because I have faith in our Zappy Boy. Once I avoid any sand attack shenanigans, the rest of the fight goes very easy and that's about all there really is to say about this one. Moving forward towards Bill's house, you might wonder about the hiker with the Onyx, and I really want to sincerely say 
that Zapdos just doesn't care. It does take some extra turns due to the resistances and it has bind, but it's really not bad at all. As far as I'm concerned, we are just training for Bruno right now. After all that is taken care of, it's time for Misty. Electric has a great matchup here, but Starmie is always scary and has that potential to crit and that's why I held off until after Bills for this. I'm ready for her at level 20, but what ends up happening is Starmie does just get an X defend and goes for a tackle and it's just super easy battle and we can move on just like that. Picking back up at the SSN, unfortunately Zapdos cannot learn Body Slam even though I would love to see this big yellow bird just slam into things. And really the only extra thing I do is pick up the rare candy guarded by the gentleman before moving on to the next rival fight. And with how legendaries work and with how much stats you get each time you level up, this one is significantly easier than the already easy rival fight from earlier. I can now just one shot the Pidgeotto, but it does shoot me the proverbial bird finger by getting off a quick attack before it goes down. And the rest of the fight is just whatever. Once again, we can just move on and save ourselves some time. As far as Surge goes, all of my two attacks I have will be resisted. And since Thundershock is a weaker move, I'm just going straight Drill Peck for this fight. Outside of Voltorb having awful moves, his other Pokemon can't really hit me too hard either. So this kind of works both ways. At the end of the day, I'm just tossing out Drill Pecks until everything faints. And although Thunderbolt still hits me pretty hard from the Raichu, this is yet another simple fight for the biggest of birds. The extreme important part and perhaps the most exciting part is getting Thunderbolt with 125 base special and the stab bonus. Guys, this is the strongest Thunderbolt in the entire history of Generation 1 and I'm ready to see it in action. And as far as attacking moves go, we have hit the very low peak of Zapdos, my friends. This is as far as attacking moves go, we're done. There won't be any seismic tosses or any other coverage moves. All we have is our beak, some electricity, and some determination. Before we move on, on, there's one more potential pesky problem in Rock Tunnel. The self-destruct hiker has all the makings to make things rough, but Drill Peck does some pretty respectable damage. I'm able to avoid self-destruct on the first two Geodudes, and I get through them without too much happening. And this is the part where you might expect me to say the Graveler crits me with a self-destruct or something, but no. He doesn't go for self-destruct at all, and I just take him out too. Once again, Zapdos does not care, guys. Now we can look ahead towards Celadon, and here's where I make the the first main adjustments for my first run. The first is to notice how I skip the Pokemart. I want to return here later and wasting a trip in there now is just an overall time loss so I keep moving towards the regular route. Now I'm just going to go straight to Erica. Zapdos has an excellent matchup for her and going here isn't the change up. The actual change up is that on the first run I did battle pretty much all of her extra trainers in the gym and obviously extra battles means that I wasted more time. The thought process behind that was that I let the notion that Zapdos was going to get hard walled get in my head a little bit and after gaining the knowledge of the complete run I knew that this time I could save a lot of time here several minutes right here alone. So instead we just rushed straight to Erica, and just like with Mewtwo I apologize in advance that a lot of the battles just aren't going to have that in-depth commentary. There's just not a whole lot to say. Zapdos has some pretty insane stats and with a stabbed super effective move that means I'm not even going to take a single point of damage here but the important the important part is that this is one of the big adjustments for my first run. So next up is the rocket hideout and I'm doing the bare minimum and now we got our next rock and ground type hurdle so we can see if this is the fight that finally challenges Zapdos. And the answer is going to be no. Zapdos doesn't care how many times do I need to say that. Just listen guys, please. I will say that Onyx with rock throw does a ton of damage to me but I'm still able to outpace it and despite taking a good chunk of super effective damage I'm able to squeak out a victory here and I'll bring this up again later but Zapdos has not had a single reset in the entire run so far. But that's not really that impressive. We're kind of early into the game, but I don't think another Pokemon can say that so far in any of my runs. Continuing on in Pokemon Tower, and I know some of you might be surprised here, but rival number four is a joke of a fight. It's easy. Shocking, I know. I even debated whether or not I should just cut it out of the run, but the completionist in me likes to keep in all of the main battles, and I just couldn't force myself to do away with it. At least we get to see some overkill with the strongest Thunderbolt in the Kanto region. Now let's pick it up. We're going to go all the way down to Fuchsia straight into the Koga battle. We are a little under leveled here, but we got the strongest Thunderbolt in the land. And the only thing you need to know is that none of 
have Koga's team resist it, and it melts through most of his Pokemon in a couple of hits. I do take a smoke screen, but it ends up not really affecting the battle in any way, thank god. Now earlier I mentioned that I hadn't lost a battle yet, but when Weezing comes in, it uses the scariest self-destruct I have ever seen. But Destiny is on our sides today, it's with us today. Big Bird, praise Big Bird. I survive with 2 HP and I'm able to keep our no reset perfect run intact. And that's another gym down. We do get the speed portion of the badge boost, but it really doesn't matter. Zapdos is already incredibly speedy anyway. From there I pick up the final HMs of the run and now we can finally visit the Celadon Pokemark. I did pick up a Pokedoll for Mimic in the future, but the main reason that I held off earlier you might be wondering was because of that sweet cash money. I have just been hoarding up all the cash that I could. I've been saving up the nuggets. I've been going for those extra vitamins, not using them just so I can sell them. And what I want to do is get as many proteins as I can to boost our attack. I have one protein from the Safari Zone and I'm able to buy six more and that can max out our attack stat experience and I'm able to get one extra calcium for just a little bit more special. The extra attack here really gives you that little extra push for some of those tougher battles in the game when all you can do is go for that physical damage. Overall this really didn't take that much extra time since I skipped the Pokemon earlier but that does mean that now we can get back to our regularly scheduled run. Now it's time to take a visit to Silph Company and outside Outside of picking up the rare candy on floor 10, it's just straight to business. Rival number 5 is always a good test of a solo run's power level, and let's dive into it and see how it does. Pidgeot is up first, and if anything, suck in how good it feels to utterly destroy another bird that can only dream about being as big as us with our massive, huge, supercharged Thunderbolt. From there, I'm going to save us all the trouble of trying to build up some suspense, and I'm going to go ahead and reveal that even at level 36, Sap does has no problems here. In fact, everything else is actually a one shot and that's without any critical hits at all. If you guys need to know how powerful this Pokemon is, look no further than this fight. And on my first run, it was during times like these where I started to figure out that there was no need to grind at all. Needless to say, this is very impressive, but let's keep it moving. Giovanni number two is next and it's where we get another taste of ground types that might start to give us some trouble. Fortunately, the beginning of the fight is against Nidorino and and Kangaskhan, you've probably already caught on to Pokemon that don't resist Thunderbolt, don't stand the chance, and it's no surprise what the result is for them. Instead, let's take a look at the ground types. Rhyhorn does take four drill pecks to take out. I do get a tail whip, and eventually it goes for a horn attack. I do actually take a decent chunk of damage here. At the end is Nidoqueen, and while ground is immune to electric, it's important to know the distinction that it's actually the rock part that usually goes along with the problems for Zapdos. With good attack and the fact that ground doesn't resist flying, that means that drill pet can still do massive damage and it's really not a problem. Afterwards, I do pick up Mimic for the future and then I immediately make my way towards Sabrina. Frail Pokemon against something with a high attack and a stabbed move is a very tasty recipe for this fight and while drill pet isn't just one-shotting everything, it's still a very easy battle. Mr. Mime can survive a move, as does the Alakazam, but it just uses Reflect on its turn and it's already taken so much damage that it doesn't really matter and we just keep progressing on after another badge. From there it's a little bit of a stormy day in real life but I make the swim down to Cinnabar anyway and after doing the absolute bare minimum I now know that Tombstoner brother is indeed real because I saw Tombstoner Tom for myself a few episodes ago. As far as Blaine goes you already know that Zapdos is just gonna kill it here. Even if I did have any potential trouble I could always learn Mimic and take agility to give myself some extra stats, but it's not even needed. Thunderbolt does crit on the rapid dash, and that's really the most interesting thing about the fight, and that's seven badges down. Now guys, we have the ground type gym coming up. One might think it would be an issue, but I think even without Mimic, we could still probably do this all right. But we do have Mimic, so let's just see how this one goes. On the right horn, it's just a slog. There's not much you can do. You aren't in any danger here, and it just takes you a while to get it down with drill picks, but this is fine, so let's just move move on and talk about the only part of the Zapdos run that really has any strategy to it. Since enemy Pokemon don't learn TMs in Pokemon Red and Blue, Dugtrio is your ticket for this fight. Although it doesn't have Earthquake, it does have Dig. And just imagining Zapdos 
digging holes into the ground and then popping out to do a bunch of damage just makes the entire run worth it by itself just to think of that. Since Dugtrio is so frail and it doesn't resist flying, there's really no need to use Dig just yet so a drill peck will move you on. And from there, that's basically the fight. I'm not 100% sure but I do think that two drill pecks on the Nido family might do more damage than one Dig since I can't one shot them anyway. But I do use Dig and I potentially waste a turn here and there. But when you finally make it to the end against Rhydon, it's just really tanky. It takes a ton of turns to finally get it down. And if you had taken some Tail Whips earlier and maybe it connected with some Stomps, you could lose this battle pretty easily. But as it stands now, it's another one shot victory. And guys, I talked about it earlier, but that's eight badges down and I still have not lost a battle yet. No resets. Zapdos has performed flawlessly up to this point, And since we had such an easy time on rival number five, you'd really have no reason to think that that's going to change. But let's just take a look. I take a quick attack on the Pidgeot, but it's no surprise that one Thunderbolt can take us on to the next Pokemon. Rhyhorn is next, and we've seen this already several times. It's just going to take a while. I do get my defense lowered, and I take some respectable damage, but at the end of the day, just use about 30 drill pegs and you're fine. Growlithe is third, and I get into my own head here. I'm thinking about not losing a battle, and I go for Mimic on its agility, thinking that it was a smart play, and even after I take some scary damage, I still go ahead and use agility, and I just proceed to take even more damage before I finally move on. I'm at 25 HP, and that's not great going into the final leg of the fight. Execute doesn't matter. I have Drill Peck, and I just enjoy every single second of it dying from it. Alakazam is up next, and this is where the gigantic level advantage matters. It has seven levels over me, and a Drill Peck cannot one-shot it, and with such low HP, a single side beam can take me out. And guys, this is my first reset of the entire run. This battle right here is what inspired me to do the near perfect thumbnail. I decided to put it up there because at this point I was playing this one so flawlessly and I do think my own self-made mistakes cost me that battle rather than Zapdos just not being able to do it. So let's skip deeper into the second attempt. I make the adjustment of just not wasting any terms on Mimic and I just quickly take out the Growlithe and of course the Execute follows right after it. This time without agility, Alakazam does out speed me but it just goes for a wasted recover. Drill Peck still obviously isn't going to be enough to one shot it and it fires back with a psychic but our high special tanks it like a champion and I'm able to finish it off on the next turn. Next up Blastoise comes in and Thunderbolt looks like it did about 99.9% .9 of its health and it retaliates with a hydro pump and that brings us extremely low but once again our special makes us a pretty thick little bird and I'm able to take it out in the next turn. Finally guys Zapdos has experienced a tough battle where its superior stats alone just weren't enough to breeze through it. But the real question is, is this trend going to continue on the Elite Four? We've seen ton of Pokemon do great on the gym portion of the game and then struggle when it comes to the last fights. Will this be the case here? The entire run has been building up to that battle with Bruno. It's weird to think that someone has been telling me for seven months that Zapdos will have a tough time on Bruno, but I've just kind of accepted that that's my life now. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm I'm ready to see how it all shakes out. But first, let's keep things in front of us. I do actually pick up the optional rare candy in Victory Road, and I'll talk about that later. And the only other thing to note is like usual, I do use up all but a few of my rare candies, and that gets us up to level 52. Up first is Lorelei, and I have a sneaking suspicion that Zapdos might be able to do all right here, but let's just take a look. Dugong is up, and just like that, I go first. I crit on a Thunderbolt, and we can just move on. Cloyster is next. It's got the highest defense in the entire game game, but its special leaves a little bit to be desired, and what that translates to is the strongest Thunderbolt in the game, obliterating it. Slowbro is up next, and if you are being safe, you could mimic Amnesia, but why would you want to do that when you can just one-shot it with a big bird bolt? Jinx is next. It's not weak to Thunderbolt, but its defense isn't that great, so Drill Peck can once again move us on with another one-shot. Lapras is next, and this is why you might want to use Amnesia. Thunderbolt surprisingly isn't a one-shot, and Blizzard is is super effective against us. It does some really heavy damage, but it's not enough and the fight is over. Zapdos has a great matchup here and it's really not a surprise how this fight went. But ladies and gentlemen, the reason for me doing this challenge, I was told Bruno was going to give me some hell. So let's see how all of that unfolds without putting it off anymore. Onyx is up first and it knows rock throw and it goes for it immediately and does some pretty decent damage. It's looking like it's going to take about 30 drill pecs to get past this one, but Bruno 
Kano is one of those pathetic trainers that doesn't have good AI, so he'll just use any random move. So he goes for a slam, and then he locks himself into rage. This means a couple of more drill pecs can't finish it off immediately, and honestly, it wasn't too bad. This is where those proteins I bought earlier really come into handy. And I guess you could have mimicked hard in there, but I think the way better strategy is to go ahead and take Ice Punch for the next Onyx on the Hitmonchan, and after Hitmonchan misses a counter for no reason, a single drill peck is all that's needed here. Hitmonlee is next. It's weak to flying as well. I outspeed it. A single drill peck is all that's needed. Let's move on. Now comes in the next Onyx, the next huge wall for Zapdos. And all you gotta do is just use that Ice Punch you mimicked earlier, and that's it. Finally, the Machamp is last, and it's got a little bit of bulk. It can actually take a single drill peck, but all it does is use a Leer on its turn, and that's the fight. Honestly, I'm really disappointed by this outcome. Outside of taking a lot of drill pecks to get past the first Onyx, it was extremely easy. I never even lost a Bruno, even on the very first run, and it being such a pathetic battle is why I did a second run that cut out all the optional grinding in the first place. But like always, Bruno, he's pathetic. Let's not dwell on it any longer. Next up is Agatha, and I don't have a great answer for her team. I do outspeed, and Drill Pet can't one-shot the Gengar. I'm bracing for a Hypnosis, but she just aggressively swaps into the Golbat, which means that it's Thunderbolt time, it's an easy one-shot. Now the Gengar comes back in, but it's already been hurt really bad from that first Drill Pet, that means I still outspeed and I can finish it off. Haunter is next, and since it's weaker than Gengar, I can actually put this one down with another Drill Pet, and we can just keep moving on. Surprisingly, Arbok is not a one-shot, but I do get pretty lucky here. I get it low enough for a retroactive Super Potion, and that means that I don't take any potential damage or a pesky status condition. And being at full health on the last Gengar, this one's all but over. There's a 75% chance that it will not do direct damage to you. And after a drill pack, she goes for a Confuse Ray. I don't hurt myself and I just take the battle just like that. And let's just keep it rolling. Next up is Lance. And I did learn agility at level 55 after using one of my last rare candies. But can I just say that this is one of the most satisfying obliterations of Garrett that I've ever had. If I wasn't lazy, I would calculate the exact damage that this does and see how much overkill it was, but I just thoroughly enjoyed this one. On the first Dragonair, I really debated on taking Hyper Beam, but I decided to go for at least one agility for the extra stats. I take a critical hit Hyper Beam that does massive damage here, and for some reason, I decide to go for a second agility since it's going to recharge on its next turn. I then do a Drill Peck, and sadly it's not enough to one-shot. I take another hit from Dragon Rage, and I'm getting really low here, and I'm thinking that this is probably going to be another reset, the second one of the run. On the second Dragonair, I get a very fortuitous critical hit that eliminates the chance of me not getting hyper beamed again, but let's see how the rest of the fight goes. Aerodactyl is next, it's weak to Thunderbolt, I have agility set up, so you know how the end result is going to be for that. Now it's down to the final Pokemon, Thunderbolt is neutral damage and my strongest move, so I just let it rip. It does heavy damage but it's not enough. Dragonite goes for a slam, it misses, and that means I'm able to finish off the fight despite a very scary early part of the battle against that first Dragonair. Last up is the champion fight, and let's see what happens here. It's no secret that I can dominate the Pidgeot, I've been doing it all game, but for the sake of being safe, I do want to set up all three agilities here to be as strong as I can be. I resist all of its moves, but it does hit me with a critical hit sky attack that kind of hurts a good bit, but at the end of this one, I'm set up and we're moving on in the fight. Since I took some decent damage already, I kind of change up my plans a little bit here. Originally, I was just going to blast through the battle with my offensive moves, but I decided to take Recover with Mimic to be safe. I take a Psy Beam, but our high special tanks it very well. I use a Drill Peck, I get a crit here, and that moves us on. Rhydon is up next, and it's another Pokemon that I just can't take out quickly. Originally, I was going to take Psychic from the Alakazam, but like I said earlier, we had a little change up of plans and luckily Rhydon is inept at doing any damage so we just kind of slowly chip away at it and we use recover when we have to. This takes a while and I get my defense dropped a ton. While the extra badge boost from that is pretty great it does mean that eventually those fury attacks start to add up but 
At the end of the day, we got recover and we eventually get it down. Arcanine is next and I'm just ever so slightly off of being able to one shot it. It lowers my defense even further and I'm able to move on. Now at this point, I'm extremely boosted. I have three agilities and like five tail whips and leers on me. So there's no question that this drill peck is gonna send this executor to the ninth realm. And with all those boosts I just mentioned, it's very fitting that we end the game with the strongest thunderbolt with another one shot. And that's the run. Zapdos has done it, and this run was fantastic. I'll talk a little more about it in a second, but this run is a lesson that even if you saw a big channel do a run, it might not be as bad or as good as it looked when they did it. You just never know how a Pokemon's gonna perform until you do it yourself, and that's personally for me what makes this still fun to do after all these runs. But let's go ahead and take a look at Zapdos's final stats before I talk any further. Zapdos finishes with a level of 58, and it has a final time of 2 hours and 46 minutes. This means that it's tied with Mew in the same in-game time. At 4th place, I think the mere fact that Zapdos had a nearly perfect run where the only reset was a mistake on rival number 6, and also if you take into account that Zapdos has zero coverage moves and was still able to get this time, it just gives it a pretty big edge. I have to say Zapdos is number 4 even though I love Mew. So I went into today's run fully expecting to struggle a little bit, but what I got was perhaps the easiest run I've ever had outside of Mewtwo. There are a couple of things I think I could further do to save some time, and maybe that would push it ahead of Alakazam for third place, but I just don't see the need for that. I only did the second run in the first place because I had a final time of like 2 hours and 58 minutes, and by the end of the run I just knew that I could save at least 10 minutes plus. I think Zapdos could easily be around Nidoking's time, or or even better if it just didn't have to waste so many turns on those rock and ground types throughout the game. Those fights like Brock and the hikers that you have to fight really early just slowly start adding up the turns and at the end of the day that's what puts it just outside of that elite range but overall I'm very happy with its performance. Now let me know what you guys think about this run down below and I can guarantee you guys that there's going to be some struggles next week when we do a Scyther run. For some reason many of you want that run and all I can say is that it's not the best you better be ready so make sure you tune in for that one and that honestly that's all i got for you guys thanks for watching i hope you guys have a great rest of your week and i'll catch you guys on the next video bye